The audience packed a house that could have been sold out at twice the size, wrote New York Times critic Olin Downs on February 13, 1924, of a concert stage the previous afternoon at the Aeolian Hall in New York City. Billed as an educational event, the Experiment in Modern Music concert was organized by Paul Whiteman, the immensely popular leader of the Palais Royal Orchestra, to demonstrate that the relatively new form of music, called jazz, deserved to be regarded as a serious and sophisticated art form. It starts with an outrageous cadenza of the clarinet, wrote downs of the now famous two and a half octave glissando, then makes Rhapsody in Blue as instantly recognizable as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It has subsidiary phrases, logically growing out of it, often metamorphosed by devices of rhythm and instrumentation. The music critic of the New York Times was in agreement with Whiteman's basic premise. This is no mere dance tune set for piano and other instruments, he judged. This composition shows extraordinary talent, just as it also shows a young composer with aims that go far beyond those of his ilk. Gershwin was born as Jacob Gershevitz in 1898 to Russian immigrant parents Morris and Rose. In Brooklyn, where he was immersed in a vast range of music, he left high school at the age of 15 to work in Tin Pan Alley for three years as a pianist plugging sheet music for Remix Music Publishers. Quickly absorbing both the writing and performing styles of his time, Dershwin moonlighted as a vocal accompanist and dabbled in composition. At a mere 20 years old, he scored to fame with Swanee, a musical hit for Al Johnson. Within the next few years, the flow of songs continued, including several Broadway musicals. Gershwin's early pieces were mostly unpopular. His first composition, When You Want Him, You Can't Get Him, earned him a total of $5. However, Gershwin was an ingenious composer, and Al Johnson recognized this. The singer took George Gershwin's composition, Swanee, and helped put him in the spotlight by selling two million record copies making it the largest selling song of his career and giving him the recognition which would later make Rhapsody in Blue such a well-known piece. The genre of Rhapsody in Blue that is best known as is a piano concerto, a work for piano and orchestra. The piece was one of the first scores to be classified in this version of music. Rhapsody in Blue was originally a two-piece set which had Gershwin as one of the pianists. Gershwin delivered the work to orchestrator Ferd Grof, who arranged the playing of it for 23 players. A jazz band run by Whiteman added string instruments and the included piano. Although jazz critics do not classify it as fitting into the category because there is no improvisation, the piece most closely follows jazz harmonies as opposed to classical, making it a hybrid with elements of both classical and jazz. The instruments played in the piece included those of traditional jazz music, such as five saxophones, four clarinets, a tuba, three trombones, two trumpets, and a variety of string basses. However, classical instruments such as a violin and oboe various flutes that made up the woodwind section, and two pianos, one of course intended for Gershwin to play. Gershwin received inspiration for the Rhapsody while riding a train, and the movements that came with it are reflected in sections of the work. The stride and shuffle labels that can be found in the piece derive from popular music slash dance styles during that time. The love theme that is found originates from a melody that was written by Tchaikovsky for Romeo and Juliet. This piece was included into the set. So today, we're here with renowned orchestrator and pianist George Gershwin. So George, what made you want to start playing the piano? Well, initially, I wasn't the one in my family who was supposed to be playing the piano. It was intended for my brother Ira, but after I took a liking to it, my mother said that I had a great unmatched talent for it, and she gave the piano and all the books that came with it into my possession. 
Interesting. I'm aware that you weren't very well off as a child. Yes. How did you afford these piano lessons? Actually, I didn't. My piano teacher at the time, Charles Hamitzer, didn't make me pay for lessons. He said that he recognized my natural talent, and because of this, he didn't feel like charging me. That was very kind of him to pay for your lessons like that. Did you take regular schooling too? Initially, I did, but because of my newfound talent that I had for piano, I decided to drop out at age 15, pursue what I loved. I see. And do you think that was a wise choice to drop out of school at such a young age and pursue a career like that? Oh, definitely. When I dropped out, I went straight to Tin Pan Alley, and I became the song quoter there. When I was there, I learned a lot of different musical styles that I incorporated into my music in my later career. That's outstanding. Was that your first published work? Well, actually, in my earlier career, I tried incorporating a Broadway-style theme into my music, and I ended up publishing When You Want Him, You Can't Get Him, which earned me a total of $5. Wow, that is most unfortunate. It's a good thing that I didn't discourage you not to pursue other things in your career. What was your inspiration for Rhapsody in Blue? Actually, there was none. When Paul Whiteman hired me to play the piece at his concert, I didn't have anything in mind, and I only had a matter of weeks to write it. It was very rushed and unexpected, and I didn't think it would get anywhere. That's amazing. It's quite a feat how well it turned out, considering the short period of time in which you had to write it. Thank you. And its success was very unexpected, but it was welcome all the same. I was very happy with the end result of the piece. Fantastic. Now, coming back to the subject of your brother, did you ever work with him with any of your pieces? Quite a lot, actually. I would write the songs, and my brother would put words to them. You were a pretty amazing duo. In person, my brother was a good deal like his music. Vibrant, dynamic, and honest, and, if I may, charming. He was full of life and lived a full day. Although most of it was devoted to the piano and his music, it was a continual source of amazement to me that he found time to engage in so many other activities. He was a fine painter, a good golfer, a discerning and courageous art collector, an excellent photographer, a wonderful dancer, whether at a ballroom or taking a moment out of the show rehearsal to break into a tap dance. It was about 50 years ago when a piano was hoisted through the window into the front room of our flat on 2nd Avenue on the Lower East Side of New York City. My parents had in mind that I, as the oldest child, was shortly to start taking lessons. But the upright had scarcely been put into place when George, he was then 11 or 12, twirled the stool down to size, sat, lifted the keyboard cover, and played an accomplished version of a then popular song. Naturally, we were all startled at this hitherto undisclosed talent of his. How? When? We wanted to know. He made it sound very simple. Whenever he had the chance, he'd been fooling around and experimenting on a player piano at the home of a schoolmate around the corner. So, with little discussion, and certainly no argument from me, it was decided that the lesson taker would be George. George quickly learned to read music and soon was playing the assembly march at school. Later, he performed the same function at the High School of Commerce, but he remained there only one term. Broadway and its songs fascinated him far more than a future of double entry. After an audition at Jerome H. Remick and Company, where he was asked to play not only some of the house songs, but to transpose them then and there, he was hired that very day as one of the staff at $15 a week. And he was only 15 years old, undoubtedly the youngest pianist ever to join a professional department in the popular song business. Sounds like a pretty amazing duo indeed. When you collaborating with your brother Ira, what comes initially? The music or the lyrics in the piece? Usually it would be the music. I would hit on a tune in my head, go and play it out for Ira, and then he would go around humming the rhythm until he got some lyrics that would go with the piece. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you today and learning all about your interesting life. Thank you.